who is responsible for that is uh, working on it. So now you will be a co-host. Okay. Okay. So should I, I start the video? The video? Yes, now you can start the okay, video. Okay, that works. Share your slides. That works. And now I will let, let me just arrange a little bit such that the video is stable. Oops. Okay. And now I try, I try to start the slides. Yes, please. We can see you very well. We can hear you very well. Okay. okay. Now we don't see your video. Uh, wait. Uh, I tried to have to kill What happens? Microphone. Let me let me see. Uh, can you see my slides? No, at the moment we cannot see them. So you have to press share screen. So let's go. Share screen. Okay. okay. I share it by uh, my screen. So uh, it should work, but uh, I don't know why it does not work. Uh, okay, there is something not working properly. So what happens when you press the green button of share screen? Uh, I get something that uh, yeah, you have to, once you press the green button of share screen, you have to select which screen you want to share. Yes, the one so your I, slides, I, I, I and select the own screen, but somehow it is somehow blocked. It is blocked. Uh, uh, and, and I do not know why. why. Uh, okay, it's something that we can to try once more. Mm. Let me try once more to share the screen. Inhalt time. Uh, so norm normally, you know, I just try to to share my uh, my, my screen, and then I get a message. Uh, uh, start. Uh, oh, start sharing. And then I get uh, it's not uh, not available because uh, uh, there is something like airplay or something like that that is active. But I cannot. I do not know how to do that. Don't see you anymore. Is that really clear still? Yeah, I still have not. Uh, I cannot. I simply cannot share my screen. Uh, do, do you have another laptop, maybe, or something? Uh, because perhaps we can uh, uh, switch a bit uh, the, the talks. Maybe we can start. Uh, and then in the meantime, we, you can try to solve it. Uh, try, yes, uh, yes, let's, let's try that. Is, uh, is, is Kelly uh, also here? Can you, can you hear me?
questions uh, around, maybe you can. So, yes, I'm here. Uh, is it okay if you uh, start your talk now? Um, okay, just okay, one just second. second. Okay, so uh, we will make uh, the sheets uh, in the program. So, Christoph, maybe you can send your slides to the uh, to the email of the institute, and we will share it in the meantime. Actually, my slides are on my homepage. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, do you want me to share my screen? Yes, share my screen. Yes, please. Okay, we can see your screen now, Kelly. Yes. Okay. You can make it uh, on screen also. Okay. So let me introduce you. Our next speaker is uh, Keith Stella from Imperial. And uh, he will tell us about taxonomy of brain gravity localizations. So, Kenny, uh, you may start. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, nice, nice. Uh, nice to be here. Sorry, is everything okay? Are we having a uh, Do we see? We have an echo. An echo? Everything is okay. Okay, I'm hearing an echo, but um, okay, this is how this is. Is it? But the sound is. Fine. Is the sound okay? Everything is okay. We be perfectly well. I hear an echo as well. Yeah, so there's a difficulty. A difficulty. Okay. Maybe you should hear something. In okay. the Is the problem my side? Probably the problem is your side because we hear perfectly here. And maybe uh, if you have some speakers with uh, create some interference, I don't know. Well, um, just a standard. I can't mute myself. We can see you now also. And, uh, Yes. Um, is it okay? But is it better now? No, I uh, it's I better of all the time. So it's. Um, I can try to. Turn off, I'll turn off my sound. Okay, so I will not be able to hear you. If I speak like this, is it done without the echo? Uh, perfectly well, so we have here. Sorry, do we, do we, if I speak, if I speak this way, this way without, without the echo, we don't hear any echo. We don't hear very well. And and the other, uh, the other yes, everything is okay. Okay, let's try. Yeah. And the echo is really loud. Okay, I'm uh, happy to introduce you virtually with uh, the colleagues in Corfu and to thank the organizers and also the Alexander von Trapp Foundation, who is uh, generous enough to, uh, to support these uh, very nice conferences. I want to talk about, uh, uh, I'll return to a, a topic that uh, I've been involved in somewhat before uh, on uh, the notion of localization of gravity on, on a brain world uh, with a, uh, a transverse uh, space that is uh, of infinite, infinite extent. Uh, his work basically uh, most recently with Chris Erickson and Rahim Long and uh, related also to earlier with Ben Crampton and uh, Chris Pope. So let me, I start already with uh, a, uh, uh, an overview, in fact, of what we're going to see. We're going to distinguish three different uh, so scenarios of uh, localization, uh, 
the gravitational forces on a brain world volume embedded in a non compact transfer space, as revealed by analysis of the gravitational fields uh, from sources that we put on the world volume. So they're the first type, which I want to mention basically for historical reasons, although it's not really how we go for this, are called type one. This is where you take a, a flat brain solution, but promote the flat world uh, metric to a Ricci flat uh, metric. And uh, we're going to call these flex books. We'll find that these are not really fully localized in the lower dimension. So that's in order to send them apart from the types, basically types two and three uh, constructions, which are fully localized point sources in the higher dimension. Now, there are two ways that this can come up. One with sort of default um, situation, which uh, involves radio coordinate, will have Neumann Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, and these will give rise to uh, um, a massive interdimension, inter intermediate dimension of gravity. Um, which is not perhaps what you anticipated, but it's what you just get from the calculation. Type three then modifies the boundary conditions at the world level. Uh, again, with the very same fully localized source in the higher dimension. Uh, and this will give rise to Robin uh, boundary conditions at the brain volume, and we will obtain masses of gravity in the lower dimension. So let's begin with the. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Could, could I ask I one? Um, could I ask a question from outside? <clears throat> Ricci flat construction, um, as I've said, is uh, is obtained by simply replacing the flat world volume on a on a brain construction by a Ricci flat manifold, as found by a Brecher and Perry. And moreover, this can be extended if uh, there is a surviving supersymmetry in the flat world volume. Uh, this can be extended to uh, an arbitrary solution of a supergravity, which has the surviving supersymmetry of the, the flat solution. And this uh, reduction to a pure supergravity brain world uh, supergravity is consistent truncation of the original higher dimensional theory. So once you're in this uh, lower dimensional supergravity, you can have any, any solution you want in there and it can be lifted back into the higher dimension. And for example, such solutions have been used to put uh, black holes into dimensionally reduced world volume theories by uh, Chamblin, Hawking and Real. Um, now, however, none of those type one constructions are really involve localized gravity on the, on the lower dimensional world volume. Um, in, as, I've, as I've said, uh, they employ a consistent kaluza klein reduction with the standard reduction ansatz. And so um, every point on the world volume has the same structure in the transverse direction, including if you put a, uh, a source in, the source in fact will have an extended uh, tail into the, into the higher dimensions. Uh, this was called black strings when you view it from the higher dimensional viewpoint by uh, Chamblin, Hawking and Rial. But in fact, since there can be, they, they basically looked at a five to four reduction of this sort. Um, but when you have many extra dimensions, that basically is symmetrical in all the extra dimensions. So a more appropriate image might be black spokes, which will be the uh, terminology uh, that uh, we'll adopt here. So I, I mentioned these for uh, basically to set them uh, in contradiction to, con uh, in contrast to um, the types of fully localized solutions that we do want to talk about. Now, in order to um, be able to discuss such things, we're going to do it in a, a context of a particular type of model, which is based upon, first of all, the salam Sezgin theory uh, in uh, six dimensions. So uh, what, in, back to 1984, Salam and Sezgin constructed was a, a six dimensional, that's one comma zero minimal supergravity with a two form tensor multiplet and a six dimensional super maximal multiplet which uh, gauged the U1 uh, R symmetry of the theory. Uh, here's the Lagrangian that uh, I've, uh, I've shown you here. I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, but um, the, uh, the, the important thing to note here is the positive potential term for the scalar field. Uh, this is a key feature of uh, uh, R symmetry gauge models, which generalize the Slomaseskin model uh, and you have uh, models with more, more general non-compact symmetries. And um, let's see, I don't know if I can get rid of this thing here. I don't know if you see it. Maybe you do, and I don't want you to see it. 
Okay, well, I tried it. Yes, this is, I don't know if I can get rid of that. Well, anyway, the, um, uh, one can generalize these models to SOPQ uh, over SOP cross SOQ um, target space for the, the scalars and uh, found uh, in a variety of papers uh, back around 2005, 2010. So um, the, this Salam Seskin theory does not admit, admit a maximally symmetric solution in six dimensions, but what it does admit is a four dimensional Minkowski space cross a, a sphere, which we'll call the vacuum, uh, together with a flux turned on for a U1 monopole uh, turned on in the, in the spherical directions. So um, now this can be lifted to uh, back up to uh, string theory, type 2a string theory or uh, M theory in 11 dimensions uh, as found by uh, Svetich, Gibbons and Pope. And uh, this uh, embedding into the higher dimensional theory uh, involved the space H22 or from 11 dimensional supergravity was uh, S1 cross uh, H22. And uh, H22 is a uh, cohomogeneity one, three dimensional hyperbolic space embedded into four dimensional uh, Euclidean space by the uh, uh, condition here with a plus plus uh, minus minus constraint. Uh, it admits a natural SO22 group action and uh, the resulting theory that you get in uh, seven dimensions, 10 minus three, has a maximal supersymmetry with a gauged SO22 symmetry and it lin linearly realized on the divisor group SO2 cross SO2. It fits neatly into the general scheme of extended salam seskin gauge models. Uh, to get specific salam seskin you can make a further reduction from bottom seven to six uh, on a circle or truncate in fact to just get the one comma zero supersymmetry in, uh, in uh, six dimensions. So here's a, a picture of the hyperbolic space where uh, actually our world volume we want to talk about is this waste, the minimum uh, radius of the uh, hyperbolas at, uh, at a coordinate called rho equals zero. Okay, so here's the details on the, on the lift back to uh, 10 dimensions of the Salam Seskin vac uh, vacuum. And um, one can write it in the following way. An interesting feature of this construction is this uh, DS4 um, um, uh, component of the metric in the uh, transverse directions, which um, is, in fact is the Gucci Hansen metric. Um, so we have uh, this this structure when you when you lift the Salm Seskin. Uh, vacuum back up to 10 dimensions. Iguchi Hansen structure is going to be important to us as, as we go on. So the, uh, now <clears throat> we want to look for a, a lower dimensional effective theory of gravity. And uh, basically following uh, earlier papers of uh, Sabasaki, Ehrlich, Hollywood, and, and Sherman, and also uh, uh, Bacchus and Estes, uh, Costas is, uh, is with us, I hope, still today. And um, uh, one can look for a normalizable transfer space wave function where we uh, let the gravitational fluctuations be functions of X on the world volume and rho, the important direction, the trans radial direction in the transverse space to be given by a separated uh, solu uh, solution, H mu nu of X times C of rho. And uh, we, have a, the, the lucky situation that we have a mass gap before uh, the onset of a continuous uh, Klein spectrum. So in fact, we look for a normalizable, L2 normalizable wave function of this sort. Because the, tra the, the transverse space is of infinite volume, we anticipate there will be a continuum, but in fact, we're going to have a situation where there's a gap between the bound state and the continuum. Uh, you can view this as somewhat analogous to an effective field theory for electrons confined to a metal by a, a non-zero work function. Uh, and in fact, so as one seen from the 
uh, earlier papers of Sabasaki and collaborators and, uh, and Costas and collaborators. Uh, the happy feature of studying the spin two fluctuations is that the transverse uh, problem, the transverse uh, wave function problem uh, is in fact the same as that just for uh, studying the spectrum of the scalar Laplacian uh, as given here at the bottom of the slide. The important part of this is gonna be this quantity Delta, which involves the, uh, the, the um, the second order operator in the row derivative. So um, <clears throat> one can rewrite the eigenvalue problem of that uh, delta operator uh, in terms of a Schrodinger equation, basically getting rid of, notice that the, um, the uh, sorry, this, this operator has a, has a first derivative piece in it, uh, which is awkward to deal with. So it's convenient to get rid of that first derivative piece by, um, see where we are, by changing it to a Schrodinger problem. So if you rescale the, uh, the, the, the eigen, eigen function by a square root of sinh two rho, you obtain a Schrodinger equation as given here with a certain potential V, uh, which is two minus uh, potential squared uh, two rho. Now um, that's an interesting potential because it happens to uh, they have a number of important properties. Let's first of all, look at the asymptotes. Um, it asymptotes to the value one for large rho, at which point the Schrodinger equation just becomes as given here, which has, a, it's, it's a nice linear equation and it has scattering state solutions uh, as given here with the square root of uh, omega squared minus one uh, in the exponent. So for omega squared greater than one, these are standard scattering states. For omega squared less than one, it's possible to have uh, bound states. And uh, <clears throat> if you um, recall the, uh, the, the, the structure of the, the 10 dimensional measure, the cosh two rho to the one quarter, cinch two rho, you find for, for large values of rho, the, uh, the condition of normalizability is given here. You see that uh, in fact, it, um, it, it has a standard uh, exponential fall off for a, uh, an, an L2 normalizable state. So we have, dual situation, we have a candidate bound states for omega squared less than one. Then there's a mass gap up to the edge of a continuous uh, spectrum here at omega equals one, where the uh, scattering states begin. Okay, now about the bound state, we come back to the particular form of this potential, two minus cos squared two rho, and it happens to belong to the class of partial teller uh, integrable systems. Uh, the study of this system and its self adjointness properties shows that it has a unique bound state that's separated by a mass gap before the onset of a continuum of delta function normalizable scattering states. And uh, now happily for uh, omega equals zero, the uh, Schrodinger equation can be solved exactly. And here is a normalized uh, result is square root of sinh two rho times the log tangent rho with the normalization factor. Um, so if we have this uh, zero eigenvalue uh, transverse wave function, the metric excitations when we reconstruct the uh, separated form, h mu nu of x times c zero of rho, uh, they will correspond at least at the linearized level to massless four dimensional gravitons on the four dimensional world volume uh, subspace time. Okay, so now the main topic that I want to discuss today is to um, go beyond this, this uh, study that I've just summarized about gravitons on the world volume to look at what happens when you actually put a source and see to what extent one can uh, reobtain uh, four dimensional Newtonian behavior. And the source should be a genuinely localized source from the higher dimensional point of view. Again, we're going to work at the linearized level. We'll look for long distance four dimensional Newtonian behavior and the stress sensor source will be taken to a point, not a spoke from the higher dimensional point of view. So we'll locate it in fact on this rho equals zero sort of belt of the uh, H22 space. Um, and we'll locate it, for example, at the, so that's the origin in the uh, transverse, uh, transverse coordinates. Now, of course, this is a somewhat complicated study uh, problem to, uh, 
analyze it, but we have uh, we can simplify it first of all by rec recognizing that there are in fact five coordinates um, which are naturally compact, and we want to look for the maximally symmetrical uh, Newtonian type solution. Of course, there will be two radii: one the row in the transverse direction, and one the we call it R in the world volume. Those we're going to have to be careful about. But uh, all these other compact directions will assume symmetry, and uh, therefore we can view the problem in a dimensionally reduced fashion um, coming down from 10 to five. Um, note, however, that we are not assuming in this analysis, this Newtonian analysis, that the, the transverse structure depends only on the C0. That we did for studying the graviton uh, problem, but for this uh, Newtonian analysis, we have to look at the full set of modes. Um, <clears throat> okay, now, there's a further simplification that we, uh, we uh, can make, at least in this leading order approximation. Uh, unlike what um, Costas Bajas and, and collaborators showed us in Samasaki, unlike that situation for the gravity waves, um, the H minu here cannot be assumed to be a traceless, uh, uh, transverse traceless uh, mode. And so we don't have the luxury of reducing everything automatically to just a, a scalar field. But what we can do is, is um, go through uh, order by order and we find that at leading order, it, the, the study of the source perturb perturbative uh, field equation still reduces to an, a, a study of uh, just one component of H00. And moreover in de Donder gauge for the whole theory, this becomes just the study of a scalar Green's function in the, in the background, which I call CGPSS because it's the Salam Seskin background lifted up to, uh, to uh, 10 dimensions. So here is the five dimensional Lagrangian that one works with after this uh, reduction and with the following scalar potential and the Salam Seskin vacuum solution now um, uh, looks as follows in this five dimensional portrayal. So that's the background around which we we're going to uh, expand and insert a source. Um, we, as we've said, we choose the de Donder gauge. Um, we have all these, these scalars that are coming out of the reduction, one of them called phi one. Um, the fluctuation of phi one at leading order can be set to zero. And moreover, if you're looking for a time independent solution, you can set the off diagonal zero row co component to zero. And this further simplifies the system to have uh, just uh, two um, <clears throat> Laplace type equations in five dimensions for H00 and H row row. And we're interested in particular in the zero zero component. And here is the, the Delta five uh, Laplace type operator that we need to, to have. So it basically involves the Laplace uh, operator on in radial coordinates on the world volume, plus the, this Delta uh, operator that I talked about a moment ago. This, oh, this com combines to make the five dimensional uh, operator for which we need to find the green function. So um, that's the next uh, topic. So we need to, to find the green function. We need to supply a uh, source on the right-hand side, taking into account the, uh, the, the measure uh, for, for the, the background solution. So we're putting a source into this uh, Salam Sezgin five-dimensional uh, picture of the Salam Sezgin solution. Kappa hat squared is the original higher dimensional Newton constant. And uh, if we define a, an overall radius, which with the appropriate factors of G, the G remember was this, the, the parameter of the Salam Seskin background solution, uh, G squared R squared plus uh, rho squared. This is a, uh, now a, a higher dimensional radius. And you find that the asymptotic behavior as, as one tends in capital R going to zero, it's as follow. It goes like one over R cubed, on one over R cubed to say, oh, that's the characteristic structure of a green function in flat six dimensional space time. So why did that occur? This is as you get close to, this is the near field structure. As you get close to the source, it's behaving like a one over capital R cubed. And um, let's see why one might anticipate this six dimensional space time structure. Well, first of all, Iguchi-Hansen space, remember, 
which uh, is the, the important part of the transverse structure, has uh, as, as smooths out near rho equals zero with an asymptotic structure that is uh, R squared cross uh, S squared. And in fact, it's this R squared part that is revealing itself. S squared we reduced on, remember. Now, actually, I said we reduced on all the other angular coordinates, including the chi coordinate. That was for simplicity in order to obtain the L5 Lagrangian, which is relevant for um, uh, sphere, uh, symmetrical uh, solutions in, the, in all the higher dimensions, the compact dimensions. But this chi is the natural angular coordinate that's associated with rho as part of an R2. So actually, there's a six-dimensional uh, behavior here near the near the origin, the Green's function problem asymptotically limits to that of six dimensional flat space time for which the one over R cubed uh, uh, Green function structure is appropriate. That's, so that's the, what one anticipate is the near field behavior. The other uh, circular coordinates in particular, the one called Psi has a finite uh, circumference. And so that is not associated to a radius as part of an R2, but the chi coordinate is. Okay, so we have some understanding of the near field structure. Uh, now we have to try to see what happens when you go far away on the world volume. Are you reobtaining something that looks like a lower, lower dimensional uh, uh, gravity? So we start out with this R cubed structure near the, the origin. And uh, we ask what happens at large world volume radius R. And here is where the issue of boundary conditions uh, comes up. And so first I'm going to discuss what's called, we call type two structure, which is just basically the default, um, the default be, uh, treatment of uh, putting a source into the Salam Seskin background viewed from 10 dimensions or really six dimensions in our reduced theory um, with, with nothing special other than a non-singularity, the metric away from the source, including at the world volume. Uh, now, of course, since we are assuming uh, angular symmetry in the chi coordinate, um, and we need non-singularity at the rho equals zero surface, but little r different from zero, so away from the origin, but on the world volume. Uh, that corresponds to Neumann boundary conditions, so the derivative of the green function, the rho derivative of the green function has to vanish at rho equals zero, again, away from r equals zero. And as you go towards infinity, you should have standard uh, uh, G tending to zero Dirichlet type boundary conditions. Okay, so that's the, the mathematical problem. And um, now you can solve that problem by separation of variables, uh, functions F on the world volume, functions uh, zeta in the transverse space. And um, again, the transverse eigen, eigen modes have to satisfy uh, Neumann at the world volume Dirichlet at infinity boundary conditions. And here are the conditions that uh, we impose. They have to satisfy also orthonormality conditions for the bound states with the, the, the Kronecker deltas and uh, delta functions for the scattering mode states. Okay, so that's the setup of the problem with transverse wave functions, zeta. Um, <clears throat> the result of what you, the, what you get from this study is in fact that the, um, this intending to be uh, Newtonian analysis is you find no bound states in this type two expansion of the green function. And the scattering uh, states are present with all eigenvalues omega greater than one. The answers here are given by Legendre functions of the first kind with appropriate normalization factors. And for the, uh, the world volume part of the solution, we have a standard given uh, uh, omega corresponding to the massive uh, portion of, this, of the spectrum. Uh, you have Yukawa type structure. Okay, so that's what you find when you put them together. You put the uh, zetas and the f's together. And you have to now sum over all modes, so integrate over omega as given here. And let's see, let's take two in interesting limits. So we now, you now need to uh, handle the special functions here. And, and luckily, um, uh, Chris Erickson uh, knows a lot about special functions. He basically, uh, reads Grudstein and Rizik for bed bedtime uh, reading. And uh, so we, can, uh, we were able to uh, extract the, the limits as, uh, so for small eta, and remember, by the way, we've 
uh, taken the green function with two sources, as one do does, uh, with two, two arguments, uh, uh, rho and eta. Uh, eta is basically the, the uh, position of the source. We lifted it slightly away from, from uh, the, the, the zero value. Rho is the location of where we're, we're observing at. And R, we, we let the, uh, on the world volume, we, we put the source exactly at, uh, at the origin. So we have only one, one argument here in the world volume direction, but we've kept two uh, for reasons that will become clear. So uh, for eta, much, much less than one. And again, the capital R, much, much less than one. We have uh, the following structure. And again, remember, if, if you can hear, in fact, you can set eta to zero if you wish. And you find, again, the one over R cubed behavior, which is uh, the leading behavior of the near field uh, solution uh, as anticipated. On the other hand, as you go far away on the world volume, so now little r is getting becoming large, you find a certain structure given here. It's a exponential e to the minus gr, some function of, of rho, and it's one over r squared. Well, this doesn't look like Newtonian gravity in four dimensions. It's not a one over r behavior. In fact, it's more appropriate to uh, massive gravity in five dimensions. This is a kind of an intermediate situation. There has been a dimensional reduction, not to massless gravity, uh, to a, a massive gravity in uh, one dimension lower than six. So that is the result. Perhaps we were somewhat uh, a bit nonplussed about that initially. And then we started to realize that uh, there's more to the story that one has to be careful about. Well, in, in fact, the key is the fact that the, the C0 wave function uh, was not present in that expansion. Okay, so <clears throat> that was uh, the default boundary condition that uh, I've just discussed. Now let's come back and, and see what happens when we uh, remember that the graviton problem for the uh, uh, just fluctuations of uh, gravity waves on the world volume required this C0 log tanch rho um, transverse wave function, which was L2 normalizable in, of the partial teller schrodinger system. That wave function actually doesn't satisfy the default Neumann boundary condition at rho equals zero, and that's why the previous discussion, what we call type two, uh, excluded it. So in order to uh, include this, you have to change the boundary condition at, uh, as rho, rho would tend to zero. And it's easier to uh, understand this from restudying the self-adjointness property of this delta uh, uh, operator, the transverse uh, Laplace and operator. And um, so for any two functions f and g, in order to be in the self-adjoint domain of delta, you require basically this uh, f uh, delta g minus g delta f integrated with the corresponding measure has to give zero. And that of course uh, is, uh, you can extract a total derivative and, and, and it becomes an, a condition on the boundaries. At rho tends to infinity, we have Dirichlet boundary conditions, rho equals zero, you now get a different um, boundary condition, which is given here, rho log rho d by d rho minus one on C equals zero. It's not Neumann and it's not Dirichlet either. It's, it's a Robin boundary condition mixed. Uh, and again, they have the same sort of Dirichlet boundary condition as rho tends to infinity. So we have this generalized Robin boundary condition at rho equals zero together with a Dirichlet condition as rho uh, tends to infinity. Now, uh, given these, uh, we can then go in and analyze again the transverse uh, wave functions. And we find here the scattering modes. We do have C0 included by, by this construction, but, and then we have the scattering modes with the same boundary conditions are changed. They now become Legendre functions of the second kind as opposed to of the first kind. So now if we put it back together, we construct anew the full green function, here's what we get. Ah, so we do now get a leading one over R piece, which does correspond to four dimensional uh, behavior. And then we have a continuum piece as well, which we in fact going to give uh, Kaluza Klein corrections. So this is, uh, this is what we get. We get uh, a one over R uh, green function, proper four dimensional behavior, and uh, this, as for large values of little r, is the far field behavior that one would uh, anticipate for four-dimensional uh, gravity. 
On the other hand, as you go back towards the origin, it re reconstructs again the near field one over capital R cube behavior. So it's interpolating between a near field behavior that looks like the higher dimensional, six dimensional theory, the far field behavior is becoming uh, four dimensional. Okay, so now on to Newton's constant. So we've achieved a proper four dimensional localization of gravity at large distances away from this mass M source. Um, there still is a dependent, however, on the transverse coordinate rho, which behaves like this logarithm as rho tends to zero. So how can, what's a sensible way of identifying Newton's constant for an effective theory uh, on or near the world volume? So one way to, to identify Newton's constant is to proceed in the same way as we, we did uh, for gravitons, which remember for gravitons, what one, one, one did there was just to uh, integrate over the transverse space. Um, and the, in, for the graviton study, all modes had the C0 uh, transverse wave functions, which are clearly concentrated near rho equals zero because they have this logarithmic structure. So, <clears throat> In the Newtonian problem, um, this would correspond to a certain uh, uncertainty or blurriness about where the world volume is really located. It's lo located around and about rho equals zero. So if we provide a, a profile, again, using the C zero wave function, uh, an average over the gravitational potential over the transverse direction, then what you, and that basically is this uh, corresponding to, to what you get from the graviton uh, study, three, three graviton vertex, you obtain exactly the same value of the Newton's constant as, uh, as you obtained uh, in the graviton study it's given here. Um, okay, so this is basically uh, my last slide now. Um, the overview is we've, we, <clears throat> in order to obtain lower dimensional gravitational behavior, this requires a, a normalizable transverse wave function, zero mode like C0. And with an infinite transverse space, uh, you have to have uh, such a, a, a normalizable wave function will definitely depend upon rho. So the, the constant transverse wave function um, of a standard kaluza klein reduction is not possible in order to have a normalizability. Uh, to allow for such a transverse wave function that you have to have appropriate boundary conditions as you approach the world volume, and they need to be modified with respect to the default Neumann conditions. We found these uh, uh, generalized Neumann, uh, generalized Robin conditions. Uh, implementing such a modified uh, transverse boundary conditions in the near the world volume, you can achieve the four dimensional far field uh, one over R gravitational behavior appropriate to four dimensions, and also preserving the higher dimensional near field one over capital R cube behavior as you get close to uh, a mass point source. And this um, emergence of such four dimensional behavior uh, as far as we've seen here is dependent on the existence of the mass cap in the transverse wave function eigenvalue spectrum for this uh, salam sesgin background. It, it, it came because the, um, the corresponding Schrodinger problem for the transverse uh, wave functions had this uh, uh, pressure teller structure. A final remark is that our, in, one, in a paper that's important to us um, was uh, at the very, the bottom of, of the page, the detailed analysis by of the Randall Sundrum uh, Randall Sundrum two model by Giddings, Katz, and Randall, uh, in fact, has uh, definite similarities to the structure here. In particular, with the importance of uh, the implementation of the well, of boundary conditions as compared to the default boundary conditions. So, thanks for your attention. I now try to turn on my sound so I can hear you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for your talk. And uh, please, if there are any questions here in the auditorium, there is one question, Costa. Maybe you can hear us, right? Hello? Yeah. Hi, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so the question is, uh, these boundary conditions, you think they correspond to different consistent string backgrounds or one should be chosen by some principle other than self-adjointness? Well, that's the easiest way to see the boundary condition. Note that it's, it's a, I mean, it's a universal boundary condition. In fact, it's, it's the same boundary condition one has in order to allow the C0 
wave function for the gravitons, it's exactly the same boundary condition that one has in. The, this is the problem that we studied, you know, some years ago, uh, which we, you and I have talked about. Um, uh, so that is the same boundary condition that you need for the Newtonian problem. But it is, of course, dependent upon the background about which you are expanding, and which in this case is this Salam Sezgin uh, structure. But you, you could choose different boundary conditions for the same background, I understood. Uh, or, or did I get this wrong? Well, so there are two points of view. One is to just say, okay, here we are in some 10 dimensional theory uh, where we decide to put uh, some, we notice this has this kind of hyperbolic structure with a minimum radius in one coordinate, it's what I call the psi coordinate. Let's decide to uh, put a source there just for fun. Uh, could put it anywhere in this space time, let's put it there. And then we see what the solution is. And then you find that that doesn't correspond to the concentration of gravity in, in four dimensions. What it does correspond to is this, this as, as you go far away on the world volume, of course, you don't necessarily have a right to expect flat space structure here. This is a highly curved space. It happens to have flat subdirections. But as you go away in the little r direction on the world volume, you don't find a, one, a, a, a Newtonian behavior. You find this rather five-dimensional massive behavior. And that's without any additional boundary conditions. Or rather, in the radial coordinate, the boundary condition is straightforward, ordinary Neumann for an S-wave type uh, uh, solution. And so then you realize that in order to reproduce what one found from the graviton study, you need to change the boundary condition to, uh, to, to this Robin boundary condition. Um, so that's basically, we found that it, it, and in fact, this analysis is very similar to, to what happens in the randall sundra model, where they also are, um, are not imposing uh, the standard boundary conditions on anti de Sitter space. That they actually have special boundary conditions because they've cut and folded the space over, and that implies a particular boundary conditions for the, the background they study. And this analysis um, actually works in, in a rather similar way to Randall syndrome. I would like to invite questions from the uh, attendees online. Is there a question? Uh, you may raise your hand online. If there is one, no. anything else from the audience here? Uh, I don't see any, so I'd like to thank uh, Kelly again. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, Christoph, uh, can you share now? Let's try. Okay, uh, you are so now. See my video. Okay. My video is still deactivated uh, by you, by the uh, host. Uh, uh, excuse me, can you repeat? The video is still deactivated by the host. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, that's what it tells me. And uh, the, of course, it's, uh, no, so and, you can, uh, the screen sharing yeah. also does not work, actually. Uh, it's the same as before. It tells uh, uh, some message that AirPlay is active, which is not true. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. I think it does not work. The zoom. Uh, I stopped sharing, by the way. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Uh, so, can you start to share screen now? I try, but it doesn't work. I, I put start uh, sharing. It's, uh, uh, tell us it's not available. Okay, let's do the following. Uh, I, will, uh, I will ask Hans speaker if he can speak now, and then in the meantime, you will talk with our uh, computer experts here, and we will find some solution. Hans Peter, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you enable my video? 
Hello, nice to hear you. Uh, yes, can you make uh, Hans Peter Miller's co host? Yeah, I'm co host. Let me see. Okay, we can see you. Now we don't see you. Now we see you again. You see uh, me. Okay, good. Fine. Hans Peter, uh, you can share your screen now. Let's see. Okay. We see your screen. Do so you, you can make it full screen. You see my screen? I see, we see your screen and we can hear you. So now I can introduce you. So our next speaker is uh, Hans Peter Millers from uh, Bonn, and uh, he will tell us about high scale inflation and winter to come gravity. Hans Peter, you may start. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would have preferred to be in Corfu, but uh, apparently. But, uh, apparently uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Very yes. well, very well. Okay, good. So I'm talking about high scale inflation, a window to, to quantum gravity. Uh, so this is uh, a possibility that is given to us that we might in the next uh, decade or so measure something which we could, uh, which could come from something which is pretty close to the to the Planck scale. So this is uh, high scale inflation. So that is inflation which uh, happens at very large energy, uh, and it can can give us insight to some fundamental uh, properties of high energy physics. The point is that it leads to sizable tensor modes in the microwave background. So if we can measure those, then we know that there is something happening at a very high scale. So it probes high energies close to the Planck scale. And therefore, it might, of course, have relevance for a discussion of what is a consistent quantum gravity theory. And it might be relevant to some of the issues which are discussed in the swampland, swampland discussion at this point. We here consider one specific uh, uh, model of inflation as, as, as an example to illustrate this uh, high scale inflation and its axionic inflation, also known as natural inflation. It is motivated by the fact that axions are abundant in string theory and it gives us a nice symmetry uh, to assure the flatness of the potential. So the outline of my talk is following. I first explain natural inflation which has been uh, uh, created in, uh, in 1990, suggested first in 1990 by these people. We'll then discuss the trans excursion, which appear for the influx in field in this case. And then we will see that actually, if we have a single axion, we can formulate, one might formulate a no-go theorem from string theory. So that this might be actually impossible. A way to go around this no-go theorem is to use is the, the way to use several axions uh, and have uh, what is known as aligned axionic inflation. Uh, we then uh, discuss the restrictions which might come from the weak gravity conjecture and what they mean for this type of inflation. This leads us then to something which we have called modulated natural inflation, which in some way will be consistent with the weak gravity conjecture and these uh, swampland conjectures and will still allow axionic inflation to work. So the axionic inflation, we, when we want to have inflation, we require a flat potential and of course, it is nice to would have a symmetry for the flatness of the potential. Of course, it should not be completely flat, so it should be slightly broken because the inflaton has to move. As I said, a natural candidate is axionic inflation. The axion has only derivative coupling, so it's flat in all order of perturbation theory potential because there's a shift symmetry of the axion, which is then broken by non-perturbative effects, instantons, and it breaks then down to a discrete shift symmetry. So this will be the axionic potential. It's a one plus cosine potential. And F is the axion decay constants, which is relevant for the size of the fundamental domain. Of course, if you want to do inflation, you have to do it within one of these fundamental domains. 
And so phi has to be contained between zero and let's say two pi f, where f is the, uh, is the axion decay constant. So if you want to make a very flat potential, it becomes flatter when you make F large, as you can see from this picture. Now, when we are looking at the, uh, the observations from the Planck satellite, which we know by now, so here's the data from 2013, but qualitatively, this is the same what we see today. Uh, so there is a certain amount of uh, fitting the, uh, the usual model, six parameter lambda cold dark matter model to the data and then see how, which range of the uh, scalar and tensor fluctuations are allowed. So you see this uh, would be the one standard deviation allowed regions from all these measurements, which we have here. And for natural inflation, you see this is natural inflation. This band is natural inflation and it leads to rather large uh, uh, tensor to scalar modes. In fact, this region here, this region here is when you have a very large F. So that's the limit when F goes to infinity, which means that you have a quadratic potential of that cosine potential. So you see that is, this is still allowed, but of course it is uh, not in the hotspot of what you can see from this uh, picture. But nonetheless, uh, uh, as we are interested uh, in, 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 in rather large tensor modes, uh, one might still think that there is some issues which we can discuss here. So these large tensor modes, let's say of order R up to 0.05, so when we have here, so up to 0.05, they are certainly allowed. If we are here, we have this 0.05, we have large tensor modes, and this brings us to physics at the Planck scale. The potential has a size of order of 10 to the 16 GeV, and they are transplanking excursion of the inflaton field. So in fact, for a quadratic potential here to lead to a flat potential with 60 E folds in inflation, the phi has to move 15 times M Planck. So this is something which now you see the phi field is transplankian, and if something is transplankian, of course you have to worry whether gravi gravitational correction spoil the picture. And in fact, in string theory, uh, one uh, can discuss in some models the possible constraints on the axion decay constants. And this has been done uh, first by Bankstein, Fox, and Gorbachev in 2003, and they have used t-duality of string theory to constrain it. So these string du uh, dualities like t-duality, they, for example, uh, follow this transformation properties of SL2 set, and they are generated by an inversion and a shift. So the inversion inverts t to minus one over t, and that's, of course, the important issue here. You can actually map that in certain string theories with enough supersymmetry. You can, you can map that to a transformation where f goes to 1 over f. So that means with this duality, if f becomes large, you should move to the situation that you take, uh, uh, you, you, you go to from f to 1 over f. So that means that for a single axion, which where this is valid, you will have an upper limit on F, which is M Planck. And that would of course mean that these large transplankian transformations of the uh, uh, displacement of the inflaton fields are impossible. In fact, the potential, what happens here that the potential is given as a combination of modular forms. It's not just the cosine potential any longer. And a sufficiently flat potential can only be achieved if F is actually much smaller than M Planck. So that means in fact that uh, uh, this natural inflation in this case is ruled out. At least uh, from this argument in string theory. Now, a way out might be the consideration of two or more fields. And that's something which we looked at in 2004. Uh, of course, in string theory, we have several axions. So we can actually uh, conceive a situation where we have, let's say, two axions and both of the axions have 
a, a, a decay constant which is smaller than M Planck. So then everything is fine with all the dualities. But now the, the axions and the potential can be uh, aligned in such a way that there is an enhanced, uh, there's an aligned axion and it has an enhanced scale. That means you can, with the alignment, prolong the fundamental domain of the aligned axion to super Planckian values. So that might solve the problem, which appeared in the case of a single axion where we have not these possibilities. So we have various axions now, and one of them has a sufficiently flat potential where the others do not have. So these are the formulae. We have two axions, rho and theta. We write down the potential, and we'll actually see when we write down this potential that a, a flat direction appears when F1 over G1 is equal to F2 over G2. And so we can define an alignment parameter alpha given by this. And when alpha is equal to zero, we have a massless field. So we will have a massless field psi, which will be the aligned axiom. Of course, it is usually, it's only massless if the potential is allowed, is aligned uh, exactly. So this is here, you can look at the potential uh, when alpha is one, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, Point one. So you see there's one flat, flatter direction like that. And of course, if zero, you have a situation like that. So what you will ha have now in the case of alignment, you will have uh, the new psi, which you can define. Uh, in, uh, so out of the, the original ones, you have now two axioms, psi and psi, psi, which is light, psi, which is heavy. And uh, so you will have the potential. And when you go to, uh, to uh, enough alignment, you will actually again have uh, a potential with the aligned. It looks like a one axiom system in first approximation where the uh, FA tilde now is the aligned axiom scale. So what you will have potential when you look from above, the potential will look like that, yet you will have this flat direction and you will have the prolonged uh, axion uh, valley where you can get uh, these super Planckian values. Okay, but now again, large tensor modes mean uh, we have uh, in some way, when we think in part of string theory or so, we will have to deal with small radii of compactification. We'll have to deal with large coupling constants. We have this very, we need to have this very flat potential. So if there are additional light modulo in the theory, they might soil the picture. So there's still a lot of thing to do. And in fact, we cannot really, we cannot really compute because it is really at the region. We can typically compute when you have large radii, when you have small coupling constants, but this is in the, uh, in a region where we cannot do it. In any case, it's still worthwhile to look at this picture and see how far we can get. We have this shift symmetry, it's broken by non-perturbative effects, but there's now this question, is there in fact an upper limit on F? And that would of course mean that there's a lower bound on R. So in some way, a model with, uh, which defines you uh, uh, tensor modes, which are large enough might in fact uh, uh, come from such a system. So we have this very flat direction, as I said, and we want to see whether there's an upper limit on MF. In the single axion case, of course, there was T-duality and we knew that F is smaller than M-string. And in the multi-axion case, these arguments, of course, are not directly applicable, but we still have to think whether this, uh, uh, how, how, how this can work and what it means. And here I come to a point which uh, is uh, uh, the so-called weak gravity conjecture. It's based on some prejudice about black hole properties. And it was uh, formulated in 2006 and some way is saying that uh, flat directions uh, should not appear in, uh, let's say in, uh, in asymmetry. So for example, you should not have global symmetry. So if you have, let's say, U1 gauge interaction and the coupling becomes 
uh, smaller and smaller, at a given point, uh, the, it will go to zero and you will have a global symmetry, which is uh, problematic in quantum gravity. So this is now a somewhat uh, generalization of this in a certain way saying cap gravity has to be weaker so that the gauge interactions cannot be too light. It gives limits on the mass to charge ratio. K, Q over M has to be bigger than one. And of course, if you have multiple U1s, you will have in a certain way have uh, to, to be outside of the convex hull, which is the region which satisfies this condition for all the different U1s which we have. Now, if the weak gravity conjecture, if it is true, it might actually be applicable to axions. You can actually, on a, uh, using some chain of string dualities, you in some way can uh, actually uh, have a same situation uh, uh, applied to the axions, where in some way uh, the axion decay constant appears prominently, and where in some way one over m, uh, ep F effective should not be too large. So in principle, one, if you now take this, uh, this conjecture, you might actually say that uh, this aligned inflation is impossible. Now the weak gravity conjecture actually comes into, in, into uh, let's say two versions. One is the strong version, and that means the lightest state has to satisfy. So the lightest state has to satisfy this uh, consistency condition. And there is a weak version where an arbitrary state can satisfy the complex hull condition. So the first one is strong. And if it is true, uh, axionic inflation is ruled out. The weak version, however, uh, allows some loopholes due to subleading instantons, which, uh, which in a certain way uh, are, uh, uh, are the, the counterpart of the, uh, the, the, the charged states in the U1 case. So there is a possibility, but again, we cannot really compute the numbers. In string theory, there are certain numbers which are of order unity, but we do not know what they are, and we do not know whether they are one over 10 or uh, 0.5 or whatever. So we think that given a, a given model and actually checking uh, whether this uh, checking experimentally observation with such a model, we can learn something about these questions where we cannot compute. In fact, when we do explicit uh, calculations, of course, we do not just get the cosine potentials, but we obtain uh, corrections to higher harmonics, which in, a, in the field theory are multi-instanton effects, and of course, which in string theory come from the restrictions of modular invariance, because your potential, of course, is not a pure cosine, but it is a certain, uh, it's, it's, it's composed of certain modular functions. And so uh, these higher harmonics, they might satisfy the weak gravity conjecture in its weak form. But on the other hand, they also lead to wiggles in the potential. And the wiggles in the potential, of course, might perturb the flat direction. So we have, the po we have, for example, if we have small effective F, so we have phi to be here in, 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 in units of, of the Planck scale. So we can have a nice uh, rather flat potential going here. So there's nothing that, of course, is sub Planck in F. And of course, sub Planck in F, there's nothing wrong. But of course, we will have a problem of getting 60 e folds of inflation. If we have uh, axion alignment, the wiggles will become more important. Phi will be allowed to go beyond the Planck scale. So this is phi, the inflaton in units of M Planck. So if you need some 10 of them, you might hear and you might still think that you see this potential is flat enough to roll and give 60 e folds of inflation. So in terms of this complex hull condition, what happens is that you have to stay outside this complex, this convex hull. If you are in the case of non-aligned axions, one over F typically is, is big enough. So in that sense, uh, you are outside trivially, but this is uh, where this is a theory where all axion decay constants are uh, sub -plunking. 
if you are going to the aligned axions, what will happen is that you violate this complex convex hull conjecture for the leading instanton, but the subleading instantons might be consistent with it. And that's in some way the loophole why this picture is still consistent with the weak gravity conjecture in its weak form. Okay. So this is now something which uh, one might call modulated uh, uh, natural inflation in the sense that we do not have, we have a kind of wiggly potentials and we have to see how far we can get with these wiggly potentials. Because you see the flat direction is spoiled by these wiggles. And then of course, we still want to ask the question, is there in fact uh, uh, an upper limit on the decay constants, which in think, if you think this, this, this uh, consistency conditions uh, that the weak gravity conjecture, if they, uh, there's some truth to it, you should not get F going to infinity. But of course, F being five and Planck or so still might be a possibility, although it would be strictly ruled out by the strong version of the weak gravity conjecture. In any case, so, the restrictions of the weak gravity conjecture are satisfied, at least for the weak form in the aligned and in the non-aligned case. And we can actually work out what happens in this. So if you look at the potential, and if the potential has some wiggles, what comes uh, when you discuss about the inflations are the derivative, the first and the second derivative of this potential. And if the potential has wiggles, of course, the first derivative, the wiggles are even more pronounced. And for the second derivative, they are even more pronounced. So that is something which, uh, which and if they are, uh, so when you now look at inflation and you look at the slow roll parameters, epsilon and eta, then uh, they will, epsilon depends on the first derivative and epsilon is relevant for the tensor modes and eta is, uh, is, 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 it comes with the second derivative. And that runs, with, this is a certain, uh, what is in, in the slow roll approximation relevant uh, for the, uh, the scalar modes in the microwave background. So if we look back now in this uh, NSR plane, so this is the scalar perturbations, this is the tensor to scalar ratio, this is uh, natural inflation. We'll see that, uh, that first of all, natural inflation in a certain way, so this is the, this is the lambda uh, cold dark matter model uh, with six parameters. So this is uh, barely uh, compatible with it. But if we, for example, look at the benchmark point for 60 E folds in inflation, due to these wiggles, when we are between 50 and 60 E folds in inflation, here in this plane, uh, uh, you see you move from this point to this point. So actually this region in the, which is in some way uh, defined with six parameters where one has put the running of the indices to zero, uh, widens up to a much larger range and allows this to be allowed. So strong variations of NS are possible with the number of e folds. So this is another, so we get here the running of the spectrum index, if you let them move from minus 0 0.02 to 0 0.02. In fact, the 60 E folds of inflation, it will between 50 and 60 it will run in this way and it will pass the allowed region here at this point. So that means that in some way, uh, this uh, aligned inflation, this modula modulated inflation is actually, com is, is, is actually compatible with the data. In fact, this can be seen best when you really look at the real data because the plops I showed you before is already something which is a six index fit to the data. The real data look like that. They give you the scalar power spectrum in terms of K, uh, and uh, which means in, in the, the, the which means also in terms of the distance. And this is the region which is allowed. And if you have a model and your model passes along this line, then it's fine. And this modulated natural inflation, which I was dis which I'm discussing is this line. It actually goes through the, through the dark uh, blue region, which is allowed. You see that uh, this, the microwave background is uh, in a certain way, uh, very good 
for a, a certain range of the, the, uh, the multipoles. For low multipoles, you have, of course, the cosmic variance. And for large mul multipoles, you do not have really the, uh, yet the precision in the data. So in fact, this modulated natural inflation is allowed. And you might now actually try to make a fit to the uh, CM, CM, uh, CMB data. So the potential which we take here, or which these people take here, Winkler, Giabino, and Benetti, uh, is that they take the cosine potential and they modulate it, uh, let's say, with the first instant. Delta is the size. And then F mod is, in a, is, 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 is given you the, uh, the size of the, uh, of the wiggles, of the, uh, the distance between uh, different wiggles. So if you fit that, there are of course higher corrections to it, but of course this is the leading correction which we have. Higher correction only become important when this completely destroys the flatness of the potential. So this is, this is what we have here. We have to have enough alignment. This delta cannot be large enough. And this in a certain way, when you now took the delta N0 range where N0 is the scalar index of natural inflation, you see this fits the data very well in this region, so this is the uh, this is the, the I think the one standard deviation. And this is the ninety nine percent confidence region. So this is the region which fits the data. So if delta is too big, then the wiggles are too big, and it doesn't work any longer. And it gives you, in some way, here you see a range of of uh, scalar indices and which is somewhat lower than you have in the other case. So this is, this is now the main. We now compare it directly to the prediction of the lambda cold dark matter model where we include R tensor models. So this is the usual picture which you will see. Uh, the, 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 the gray shaded area is typically the one standard and the two standard deviation uh, uh, region here. So this is consistent. And when we see uh, modulated natural inflation is shown in red. Uh, the triangle here is uh, natural inflation. This is essentially ruled out. It has too big, uh, too big uh, an index. And we have already seen this also ruled out from the weak gravity conjecture, if this would be true. However, you see that the fit of this modulated natural inflation is very good. Yeah, it, in, this is, this is the, 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 uh, the sweet spot of it. That would be the sweet spot of the lambda cold dark matter plus R. And it in a certain completely overlaps with this also the one standard deviation each in here. So it's good, but it makes a prediction. It, makes, it, doesn't, it doesn't reach zero, which is still possible in the fit of this data where you do not have a lower limit. So here we actually have a lower limit and the lower limit here in the 99% confidence region for this model is uh, two times 10 to the minus three. So it fits very well. Uh, so this is running, the indices is run. This is the first derivative on the index. This is the second derivative they run. So that is something of course, which also might be measurable if we have better data on the cosmic microwave background. Again, just to remind you, this works also, this is just a reflection of the fact that we very nicely go through this uh, region, uh, the one sigma Planck region. So it's completely compatible. Of course, the strongest constraints are here between zero, one and point zero. Well, there's something wrong here. This, is, uh, this should be uh, zero point one. Good. So now the question is, when you see, when you go to large power, when you go to large multipoles, you will see that this line is lower than, for example, natural inflation or some other inflation. So it in a certain way goes down here. And when we compare it to the lambda cold dark matter model, when we look at this power at very, very, very large K, uh, then you in fact see that uh, the lambda cold dark matter plus R model in some way gives you this gray area again, whereas the uh, uh, the uh, the the, uh, the modulated natural inflation gives you less power at small scales. Small scales are large K high multiple. 
So this is then a prediction. The first prediction is that you have an upper limit on, uh, on, on uh, that you have a limit on uh, on R, and uh, that you have less power at small scales. So this uh, brings me to my conclusions. Uh, as I said, natural inflation is essentially ruled out. There are two large tensor modes, so it is observationally it's ruled out. And it is also incompatible with the weak gravity conjecture. So this is in a certain way, uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, in some way uh, could be an argument to strengthen the weak gravity change. We then looked at modulated natural inflation. It satisfies the weak form of the weak gravity conjecture as well, but it gives us an upper limit on F because the lo this lower limit on R gives us an upper limit on F. And the best fit for the modulated natural inflation is an F between four and five uh, in Planck units at the one sigma level. There's a prediction that R should be bigger than two times 10 to the minus three at the 99% level. And in fact, actually also the, 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 the scalar index NS, uh, which is 0.96 to 0.97 here is slightly smaller than in the lambda CDM fit. So, it, uh, M, so the modulated natural inflation has scale dependent modulations in the scalar spectrum with a reduced power. So that's something which one might be able to test in the future. So this brings me to my summary. As I said, it gives an excellent fit modulated natural to the current CMB data. It's consistent with the theoretical conjectures. It predicts sizable tensor modes. And this comes from the wiggles in the potential. It predicts low, lower power at small scales. So this is something which uh, when, when we now see, for example, when we would see that R is satisfying here, we could look at the model back again, but then uh, it should not be just natural inflation. There should be something else like wiggles in the potential, which then can be seen to test to, uh, to be further tested, and that in, would be indirectly, indirectly also test these weak gravity conjecture, which uh, are discussed these days. So it can be actually tested in future CMB observations. There is uh, measures from the Simons Observatory that uh, the hope there is that pretty soon we'll get to the limit, which is uh, three times uh, 10 to the minus uh, three. There is some, uh, some uh, ideas, even under construction, CMB, S4, and Lightbird, they aim at something like 10 to the minus 3. But that will take another year, uh, decade before we can see it. And there is a proposed satellite mi mission which uh, plans to go uh, down to 5 times 10 to the minus 4. So within the foreseeable futures of the next two years, one might be able to get to the 10 to the minus three, which we are discussing here. If R is smaller, then of course we had to wait much longer for experiments to verify uh, these tensor modes. So thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So now I'd like to invite uh, questions from the audience here. Uh, or or from, uh, from people online also, maybe. If there is something, please raise your hand. So, uh, this, this, uh, in this last part, uh, so this uh, needle... Uh, CMBS4, is it something that is, is uh, already running? Uh, you say 2008. No, no, this, uh, this will start operations if everything works out in 2028 to 2029. So this is future. The one which in a certain way could give us data soon is this one. Of course, together with, uh, with, the, uh, with some other devices, they put a lot of devices together. So that would be the next thing uh, which one might, well, uh, would might might uh, might know in the next years 
they said uh, a few years ago, they said uh, 2021, but uh, uh, I think they didn't manage that yet. So, uh, but that is something which uh, at least in the next uh, few years, uh, we will get, uh, we will get such a limit. So we might then actually know how far we in some way uh, can uh, still hope uh, that we observe tensor modes, yeah. Because uh, if if our if the tensor modes of of course are much smaller, then we have no handle. Then we have to wait maybe a century before the the, the if, if 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 r is ten to the minus ten or so, we might need need to wait hundred years before it is measured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it is an opportunity okay. now that we get to problems. Uh, hi, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question uh, about, um, okay, you compare the predicted uh, power spectrum of the primordial uh, perturbations um, of uh, three models, the modulated natural inflation, uh, the action and the natural inflation. And you had a slide uh, where you presented the power spectrum of predicted by these three models, exactly this one. Yeah. So we we'll see that there is yeah. something which is known as axion monotromy. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, the, uh, the the yellow line which you have here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, this seems uh, so. This as it, this is the raw data. So this is consistent with uh, present measurements as well. But, okay. but the real predictions yeah. have not been worked out. So I guess these plots, which I show you here, yeah, they have not yet been worked out in this case. Okay. Um, yeah, actually my question was, uh, uh, as we see that uh, this model is uh, uh, predict that they generate uh, uh, numbers for the observables, but uh, for example, the action model predicts an oscillatory uh, power spectrum. So uh, I guess that in the future that there will be, the precision will be better. The action monotromy could be uh, tested in this model. If, for example, this oscillatory feature is not uh, observed. Um, well, the, the point is, of course, you see, as I told you, for example, this fit, which we see here, the gray blob, is in a certain way a fit where you have from the 40 parameters or so, which you could think about, you have frozen in 34 to be zero or at a given value. So for example, this does not include running of the index. Yeah? And certainly it will also be in this modulated natural inflation and also the other, other alternative models of that type will probably have running of the indices. So if you would in, take the gray area and you would include the running of the indices, this gray area would expand a lot. Okay, okay, yeah, understand. Yeah, so you have to see, this is just lambda cold dark matter and all the rest is frozen. But of course, the, the running of the indices is, 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 is not, you see, the prob it, it, it can run. It, it is allowed to run from the data. And of course, the statement, which you really, when you think in terms of the statement, is when you have a model, you should make sure that the power spectrum is such that it goes through this allowed region. Uh, the way it goes through it is different. And of course, the way it goes through differs then in some other of the, let's say of the other 30 parameters, uh, which could be non-zero and are, are fixed in the, in the lambda cold dark matter uh, fit. Yeah, so this is, this, but of course they differ from each other and it would then be, uh, if you look in detail in the power spectrum and you could measure uh, with, with more precision, you might be able to disentangle these models which you have here. And I guess that's the picture. But of course, to, to measure this uh, running of the indices is not so easy. You, you would need much, much more precision. Of course, it would mean if you start squeezing in here. So, so suppose you could squeeze in this part here with the new data. You could in certain way also see whether 
uh, some of these uh, models uh, get killed because your precision is much better and all of, all of a sudden some of these models would fall out. Thank you. Is there any other question? Me? Ah, yes. Uh, I would like to ask some naive question. I mean, you added one additional axion field and, uh, and then um, you consider influence of one field, but uh, somehow can, uh, uh, there is no idea to stop. I mean, you can add more, more fields and then it will be, uh, will be um, seems to be you know this modulation can yeah i guess i guess i i think we had we had started with two fields and uh, Choi at all they had generated is this two more fields in 2014 and in fact uh, this is what is now called clockwork picture yeah because these aligned axions they uh, they were going people were going from two to three uh, to ten uh, to hundred and uh, I guess the, the, what is nowadays called clockwork uh, enhancement or clockwork picture is actually uh, exactly based on this idea. So if you, for example, have three axions, then you could probably uh, get to a picture where you might uh, you might get uh, a region where you could get to maybe a somewhat bigger F. So we had here an F which was four to five in M Planck. If you want to enhance that a bit, it could, it could work out if you have more axions. It then in a certain way goes with this 99% uh, confidence region, you could extend them in some way. So there is, there is still some flexibility if you add more than, uh, than, than one axion. Well, I think that uh, we can also thank uh, Hans-Peter again. Hans-Peter, it was good to see you. Uh, okay, and thank you. I, thank you. I stopped sharing. But... Uh, and now we will... Uh, Hoping that uh, all technical problems are solved. Uh, we are going to have the last talk for the morning session. Actually, uh, I think the technical problems have not been solved. Uh, the problem is that uh, I'm blocked by some screen synchronization uh, that I am unable to. Uh, it has, and this one uh, is, is blocked itself, uh, so I cannot re remove it, and that blocks my screen. But Alessia is proposing to share, to, she has copied the slides, and she is proposing to have uh, a sharing. So we could try okay. it, to do it in this way. Yeah. And I will just say you next slide. Is that okay? I think it's good enough. Uh, so uh, next speaker is uh, Christoph Wetterich. Uh, from Heidelberg, and uh, he's going to tell us about uh, pre geometry and emergent general activity. So, Christoph, you may, you may start. So, next slide. Uh, first question is what is uh, pre geometry? Uh, pre geometry is a theory without, with diffeomorphism invariance that is kept, but it has no fundamental metric. So, the metric emerges only as a composite object. So if you want in short, uh, geometry is emerging, not fundamental, but the symmetry of diffeomorphisms is fundamental. So if you want, that's a bit similar to QCD. Uh, so the metric can be considered as a collective or composite degree of freedom. Uh, next slide, actually, sorry, but um, Alessia. So the metric is a collective or composite degree of freedom, and that's similar to the pions in QCD. Uh, but the basic theory is formulated, of course, in QCD with different degrees of freedom, namely quarks and gluons, and these will be the degrees of pre-geometry. So in short, uh, pre-geometry uses the same symmetries, but different degrees of freedom uh, in order to describe gravity then as an emerging um, 
phenomenon. Next slide. So why bridge geometry? Uh, well, uh, my motivation is uh, there are still substantial problems with metric quantum gravity. First of all, since many, many years, it's known that there is no valid functional integral for metric gravity. Uh, that's problematic. We just do not know how to set it up properly. Uh, there are lattice approaches, but I think it's fair to say um, that they are still quite uh, at some distance from becoming predictive and really generating uh, theory where, from which you can then uh, derive uh, reliable cosmological equations and so on. There is, of course, asymptotic safety for quantum gravity, which is, in my view, a correct approach. And uh, there should be an infinite ultraviolet fixed point permitting the non perturbative uh, formulation of a metric theory as a quantum field theory. But the picture that emerges, uh, the microscopic picture, I think is uh, rather, it's, it's, it's fair to say, it's not really simple, it's not really easy. And that uh, is one of the motivations to try perhaps the same program of a quantum field theory, but now with uh, different degrees of freedom. So next slide. So pre geometry is actually a quite old idea. I think it was first proposed by Akama uh, based on a purely fermionic theory. Um, at this time, it was not possible really to have uh, Lorentz symmetry. Uh, I worked a little later on it. And I think by now in spin or gravity, you can implement local Lorentz symmetry. Uh, but on the technical side, it's still uh, not so easy. It's a multi-fermion interaction. And to make sense out of it, uh, the methods have to be developed. So what I propose you today is something a bit intermediate. Next slide. Namely, pre-geometry as uh, Young-Mills theory. So it's a relatively simple formulation. Huh? So we want first to formulate a Euclidean a functional integral. And what we do is we just take a standard SO4 gauge symmetry. The only additional thing is it has a vector field in the vector representation, if you want, as a type of matter field. And this additional vector field, besides the gauge bosons, that allows for a diffeomorphism invariant action. So this additional vector field is in a certain sense a generalized Fierbein. Next slide. So the fields uh, that we have uh, are uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, it's just the gauge fields, a mu mn, where mn is the Lorentz index from zero to three. So they are all together the six gauge fields of SO4. And then we have this generalized Fierbein that has one world index and one Lorentz index. So these are the basic building blocks, uh, a standard Young-Mills gauge theory with uh, um, bosonic uh, matter field. You can add uh, fermions, but uh, they will not play a role for the present discussion. Now, what are the quantities to work with? Well, you want to have it uh, gauge invariant, SO4 invariant, and diffeomorphism invariant. So your basic building block is standard field strengths, non-abelian field strengths, uh, well, well known. Uh, and the second basic building block that is perhaps less common is the covariant derivative of the Fierbein. Uh, so that makes a big difference, let's say, from Cartan's geometry or uh, other geometrical formulations with the Fierbein. And normally, the Fierbein uh, has a vanishing covariant derivative. Here, it does not have a vanishing covariant derivative. Uh, it has a covariant derivative is given by two connections. One is the Levi-Civita connection, the gamma mu nu sigma, just as usual. 
uh, will uh, describe you how to form that uh, from the fear bind in a minute. And then there's of course the gauge field connection because this uh, generalized fear bind has, uh, is a vector with respect to SO4. So it has the standard covariant coupling to the gauge fields. So that's pretty standard, uh, nothing dramatic. And we see two, with these two quantities, we can now construct, next slide, uh, an invariant action. First, we want to have something for raising and lowering world indices. Uh, that can be done uh, provided that uh, we restrict the fear bind fields to the ones that uh, have a positive determinant. Uh, if it has a positive determinant, then we can define the inverse fear bind in the usual way. Uh, and uh, we can also now formulate a composite metric as a fear bind bilinear. So it's just a shorthand uh, for two fear binds. Uh, which is the usual const uh, contraction of uh, two fear binds with uh, the Euclidean SO4 invariance delta MN. And then uh, this metric, if the fear bind has an invariance, the metric has also an invariance, and we can now raise and lower indices with uh, this composite metric, and we can transform the world indices to uh, Lorentz indices in the usual way with the fear bind. The only thing you have to remember that the covariant derivative of the fear bind is not zero. So raising and lower, so transmuting indices from Lorentz to world does not commute with uh, covariant derivatives. So, but after these little preparations, it's now straightforward to write down a classical action. You just take the field strength squared uh, this is this lambda LF, and you take this covariant derivative squared, which is the LU, and that's the Euclidean action. Very simple. Uh, if you look at uh, the if next slide, uh, we are now at classical action, uh, Alessia. Uh, does it work actually, the slide uh, moving? I cannot see it, of course. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay, yes. It's, it's okay, okay, that's perfect. Huh? So, so classical action. So it's gauge and diffeomorphism uh, invariant, uh, and it has a kinetic term for both the gauge fields and the fear bind. So if you count the number of degrees of freedom, there are four times four for the fear bind and four times six for the gauge fields. So that makes a total of 40. And then you have the gauge degrees of freedom that you should sub subtract. So there are four gauge degrees of freedom for the formorphism symmetry, six gauge degrees of freedom for the SO4 symmetry. So you remain with 30 physical fields. And they're all dynamical. Uh, that's a difference to Cartan's geometry, uh, which has as dynamical fields actually only the uh, the fields corresponding to the metric. It is closely, closer related to Poincaré symmetry, uh, on which uh, I think the first papers are Hayashi, Shirafuchi, Valery Rubakov has worked a lot on them. And I will not go to this connection, but I just tell you there is a connection. Next slide. So the gauge connection is clear. The gauge field is the usual one. What is the levi civita connection? Well, once you have a composite metric, you can, of course, construct the levi civita connection in a standard form from this composite metric. It will now just be an um, object that involves the fear bind. And uh, you can express the covariant derivative of the fear bind now this one index lower, this u mu nu rho, you can express that as a difference of a spin connection that can be constructed from the levi civita connection and the gauge connection, which is this a mu nu rho. So relatively simple. Uh, we have uh, still two connections, uh, but uh, everything is well-defined. Now, 
there is a limit of uh, general relativity, and that's Cartan's geometry, and that is simply if this tensor u mu nu rho, if that vanishes. Now remember this u is a difference of the spin connection and the gauge field. So if this vanishes, this simply means that the gauge field is given by the spin connection and that's the setting of Cartan's geometry. Now, you can express the quantities in terms of the usual curvature tensor uh, that uh, you form from the Fierbein or the composite metric if you want, and this covariant derivative. Uh, for example, the field strength F mu nu rho sigma, that's the curvature tensor minus some tensor V, where V is essentially the covariant derivative of the tensor U. So if you want, V has two derivatives of the fear binds. And if you have U mu nu rho equals zero, uh, and you insert it into, into, into the action, this gives you a type of higher derivative gravity similar to Kellogg's uh, um, higher order fourth order gravity. So next slide, stability and generalize the Higgs mechanism. Next slide. So the first very simple observation is uh, this Euclidean action is positive. It has a minimum at zero and then it increases in all sides. Huh? So the gauge field part is positive. Uh, that's well known to you. But also the fear bind part uh, is just a square. It's positive. So it has a perfectly well defined Euclidean action. No problems of instabilities, ghosts whatsoever. Uh, you can, of course, look at that uh, a bit closer. You can look next slide, flat space. Um, you can look at the flat space solution, which solves, of course, the field equations derived from this Euclidean action. And then you make uh, an expansion, linear expansion, both of the fear bind field and of uh, the gauge field. Well, the gauge field uh, in linear order is just the gauge field. Uh, and then you convince yourself quickly that the high momentum behavior is stable. Of course, for the gauge field, it just gives the quadratic part of the action, which has the usual inverse propagator and is a perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly stable uh, positive uh, part. And you can do the same now for the excitation for the fluctuations of the Fierbein. Next uh, slide, expansion. So you decompose uh, the Fierbein fluctuations in representations of SO4. That's the symmetric part which is essentially the same as for the usual metric fluctuation. So in particular, it contains the graviton and there's an anti-symmetric part. And this is, once you have this expansion, you insert it in, in the action and you look at the, um, at the quadratic part of the action. Do the same for uh, the gauge fields. Uh, the only, it has now several representations. The only thing I want to mention here that there is a second field that transfers as a, that transforms as a traceless uh, transverse tensor, namely the field in U nu, uh, which is part of these gauge fields. So we have now two such traceless transverse tensors and they will mix. Okay, look at the high momentum behavior. For large Q squared, we have already the part in lambda F, which is a standard positive kinetic term. Don't worry that sometimes there is a D to the four appearing. Uh, uh, so D squared is of course just a Laplacian D to the four. That's just a, um, a question of the field state composition, which has additional momentum uh, components. And similarly, we can look at uh, lambda u. It has a first term, which is just a kinetic term. 
and that is positive for all the fields. So the high momentum behavior is manifestly positive, no ghosts, no tachyons, nothing. Well, you should not expect differently because after all, we have seen already that the Euclidean action is positive. Now, flat space is of course not invariant under diffeomorphisms and under the local gauge symmetry. They're both spontaneously broken. And uh, if a gauge symmetry is spontaneously broken, you expect some type of Higgs mechanism. The gauge bosons will get massive. And that is exactly what happens. It comes from expanding one more term in this term lambda u. And this term simply gives masses to the gauge bosons. It actually gives masses to all gauge bosons and this quantity m squared in uh, uh, as a prefactor of lambda u is nothing else than the squared gauge boson mass. So uh, that's the second important ingredient. The first is high momentum behavior. It's just proportional to q squared, but now the gauge fields get a mass, which is of course uh, the main ingredient for having at low momenta a decoupling of the gauge fields. Uh, and uh, that's the main ingredient why at low momenta we will get just standard general relativity. Uh, there's one third uh, uh, ingredient, next slide, mode mixing. And uh, this ingredient is that the gauge field modes and uh, the modes in the field bind get mixed. Uh, and what will be, for example, interesting for us, we have now the two possible graviton modes, the T mu nu from the field bind and the E mu nu from the gauge fields. And they get mixed by, uh, again, one of the terms in lambda u. So next slide. Let's look at the, the graviton sector. The graviton sector has actually an inverse propagator matrix, which is now a two by two matrix. Uh, so you see the ZQ squared plus M squared. That's the pure gauge field part. The Q squared, that's the pure fear bind part. And then there's a mixing M times Q. You see immediately that the only zero eigenvalues occur for Q squared equals to zero. Just takes a determinant, which is proportional to Q to the four. So there is no other pole. Uh, and uh, if you write the inverse propagator, uh, well, you diagonalize the matrix, it has some square roots. You convince yourself it's completely stable, no, no ghosts, no tachyons. So that's only the first part. That's the part that, that concerns the classical action. So that's how you define your functional integral. If you now want to derive field equations, you need, of course, to include quantum fluctuations. And that's typically done by computing the effective action. I will not do a quantum calculation here. Uh, I will just use general properties of the effective action. Well, the effective action has still the same symmetries, but in general, you have more invariants. Uh, you have more invariants, actually, in general, infinitely many invariants, but let's just concentrate on those with a uh, low number of derivatives because they will dominate the low momentum behavior. So the first important new invariant is the term that is linear in the field strength. Actually, you can form an invariant by just contract, con, uh, contracting the field strength with uh, two inverse field binds, and that's a perfectly diffeomorphism and SO4 invariant term. And this term multiplied by m squared, this will give the Einstein term in gravity uh, in a moment. So the effective action has now uh, given us now a way of looking how general relativity effect, uh, emerges as an effective low energy theory. We have already seen uh, general relativity is the limit where this U tensor, this covariant derivative of the fear bind vanishes. Now we can be a bit more accurate. Uh, we can just insert in uh, the action, in this effective action, the relation for the field strength as a difference between the curvature tensor 
and this covariance derivative of u. And we do the same for the Einstein-Hilbert term. The Einstein-Hilbert term is now, uh, this was this uh, term linear in the field strength. That's just a curvature scalar plus some contraction of this V tensor. And uh, if you want now, the first approximation is, of course, you just uh, take your V tensor to zero. In this case, only the curvature tensor remains. And then this is just general relativity. You can do a little bit better because there's actually a source term for U, a term linear in U, which is proportional to the covariant derivative of the curvature. And if you insert that, you get in addition higher order effective invariants that are also pressed for small momenta. So the upshot is the low energy theory has a decoupling of the gauge bosons because of their heavy mass. Yeah, so if we are at momenta below m squared, the gauge bosons decouple. And what remains is general relativity. But of course, the high momentum behavior relies on the presence of these additional fields and it's ex exactly these additional fields that make the theory stable. Uh, I'm not sure if you followed uh, Alessia with the slides. Uh, let's go to the slide graviton propagator. So we can now again write the inverse propagator for the graviton as this two by two matrix. It has now one additional uh, entry from this linear term, this, term, uh, this part proportional to the big M squared. Otherwise it looks pretty similar. And now if you look at it, it has uh, two poles. It has still the massless graviton pole, but it has also an additional massive graviton pole. And uh, this additional pole is neither Retakio nor a ghost for the right parameter range. For example, uh, the big M squared has to be smaller than the small M squared. And there's one more condition on that. Uh, but what is the important message here is uh, there's actually uh, no problem of getting a massive graviton in addition to a massless one. And you may remember many people say that this is a very big problem, a very complicated construction. Here you just have an additional massive graviton, uh, uh, which is neither a ghost nor a tachyon. And uh, if you look at the formula from U squared, there's of even a limit where M squared becomes close to, the big M squared becomes close to small M squared where this mu squared goes to zero. It's not limit relevant for, uh, for real life. You want to, to have this uh, second graviton, uh, this Planck mass mass, uh, more or less. But if you want, you could have it even massless. So the inverse propagator from this two by two matrix is easily constructed. And you can convince yourself it has no tachyon, no ghost analytic continuation is possible. So that tells you that from this Euclidean gravity, not only the classical action can be analytically continued, with, which assures you that uh, it's a unitary theory, but also the effective action can actually be analytically continued without creating ghosts or tachyons. So, that's for me one of the important results because uh, uh, you know the big power of analytic continuation. We can use, for example, uh, non-perturbative QCD computations uh, in Euclidean space, doing a lattice simulation, and then we can analytically continue. This should be possible now also for this type of pre-geometry. Uh, because uh, there is no apparent obstacle for analytic continuation. Just analytic continuation, how to do it? Well, all fields with a Lorentz index zero, they get an additional phase factor. So that uh, uh, concerns the fear bind. It also concerns the gauge fields. And actually by this analytic continuation, the SO4 symmetry group becomes now 
CSO13 Lorenz Group. Let me end this part of the construction and let and describe you a bit what type of cosmology you get from this pre-geometry. For this, I add a scalar field. And the reason for adding the scalar field is quantum scale symmetry, because in the presence of a scalar field, uh, you can have now a realization of quantum uh, scale symmetry. For example, this term m squared in terms of uh, the field strength f. Uh, this is now a function of a scalar field. And uh, if it is proportional, for example, just to the scalar field squared, uh, then the theory becomes scale invariant. So this field chi will also play uh, an important role for cosmology. Uh, just, uh, I just have given you the effective action, the lowest terms, and all these coefficients are now depending on the scalar field. I can give you an overshoot, uh, an overlook on what uh, type of next slide. Uh, the slide is now crossover solutions of homogeneous field equations. So an overview of the resulting cosmology is actually pretty simple. It has two main stages. One is an early stage where the scalar field goes to zero. The blue curve is the log of chi. So if the blue curve, if uh, for time going to minus infinity, uh, chi is going to zero. And then, uh, so that is the early cosmology. During the early cosmology, the Hubble constant is really a constant. And then there's a late cosmology where S where chi increases to large values, much larger uh, than the Planck mass uh, in this region, the uh, Hubble parameter decreases towards zero. You notice that there is no Big Bang. I may come back later to that. You can go in physical time to minus infinity. You can construct universes that exist since ever. Next slide. So nevertheless, if you retranslate that uh, to observables and for example, by doing a while scaling, you find that uh, this uh, simple cosmology actually describes a crossover between two uh, simple solutions of the homogeneous field equations. And one describes an inflationary epoch, that's the early phase, and the late phase describes a late cosmology with dynamical dark energy. So these are the main phases, and that comes out directly once you make some simple um, assumptions on the field dependence of these functions. Huh? So let me phrase it next slide, crossover from UV fixed point in the infinite past to the infrared fixed point in the infinite future. Well, the title says already that uh, this is actually this crossover in the two characteristic solutions is directly related to a crossover in renormalization group running. And I may come to that uh, in a minute. So of course, the cosmology is only specified once you uh, define your coupling functions that depend in the effective action from which you derive the field equations. And I will assume you, uh, I will assume a simple form that is actually uh, motivated by quantum gravity, uh, namely by quantum scale symmetry, by scaling solutions similar to asymptotic safety. And the form is that there's a renormalization scale K, which is the only scale in the problem. The potential is just proportional to K to the four, it's just a constant. The field dependent Planck mass has a constant term K squared and another term chi squared. This is this so-called non-minimal coupling, uh, which gives you a curvature scalar times 
scalar field squared that appears, for example, in Higgs inflation and many other models, and a similar form uh, for all the other for the other two mass terms that appear in this theory. So it's a very simple assumption, and with this assumption, you um, uh, get now this type of uh, simple cosmology that I told you before. Well, these simple assumptions actually are uh, quite well motivated because they correspond to general properties of scaling solutions. So scaling solutions are the generalization of field of fixed points for a finite coupling now to whole functions. And uh, uh, scaling solutions for quantum gravity or for pre geometry, they fix the whole scalar potential for arbitrary values of the field. You need, of course, functional flow equations for doing it, but uh, next uh, slide, scaling solutions are restrictive. So scaling solutions are particular solutions of nonlinear differential equations, and uh, they have particular features uh, that are not so common in perturbation theory. For example, in the presence of gravitational fluctuations, the scalar effective potential is no longer approximated by a polynomial. It, uh, this is relevant for many cosmological uh, purposes, inflaton, cosmon potential, Higgs potential, and so on. And uh, this uh, uh, next slide, quantum gravity, these potentials are not arbitrary. Next slide. Uh, they have a very simple form, nevertheless. Uh, they go from one constant for small chi. So u is a dimensionless potential. x is essentially the log of the scalar fields again. So uh, s going to minus infinity, the scalar field goes to zero. As x going to plus infinity, the scalar field goes to infinity. And you find that the typical potentials for these scaling solutions have to be a crossover from one constant to another. It's not polynomial, of course. If you expand for small values of the scalar field, you can find a polynomial expansion. But for large fields, it's not at all a polynomial. And that has a simple reason. It has a reason that there is actually an ultraviolet fixed point that uh, the higher the quartic scalar coupling uh, has to run to zero. Uh, this uh, is due to just a uh, standard, uh, to just to the dominant effect of metric fluctuations. It's the same effect that has given rise to the success successful prediction of the Higgs boson mass in asymptotic safety. Uh, there is simply no quartic coupling for large values of the field. That will play a role in a minute. There is also uh, scaling solutions have also a very simple behavior for this effective Planck mass. So I plotted here the dimensionless one, uh, m squared over k squared. Uh, so this effective Planck mass goes to a constant for small values of the scalar field, and then it increases fairly proportional to chi squared for large values of the scalar field. So that motivates uh, this. Uh, simple form of the coupling constant functions. Uh, of course, the real form is a bit more complicated, but uh, for the qualitative discussion, that's completely sufficient. So you have these simple coupling functions, you insert that, derive field equations, solve them, and then you get typical solutions where in early times, arbitrary initial conditions approach the scaling solution with a constant Hubble parameter, and then, uh, these scaling solutions end whenever uh, the field chi has grown large enough such that in, uh, we are now on the slide, crossover in scaling solutions induces end of early attractor. We are now at the point where m squared uh, is dominated by chi squared. Once that's it, I may interrupt you with five minutes. How many? How many minutes? Sorry? How many minutes? Okay, I can't hear you. 
I guess five minutes five or minutes. something like that. Uh, okay, so we have this uh, crossover, and uh, that explains you already why this is the general feature. Uh, next slide: uh, variable gravity as effective theory. Well, the whole inflation, end of inflation, and late cosmology is actually approximated already quite well by the, an effective low energy theory for which the gauge field fluctuations decouple because they are massive and one is just left with variable gravity, which is a theory where the important ingredient is that the Planck mass is now depending on the scalar field and for large values of the scalar field, uh, the Planck mass is just proportional to the scalar field. So these variable gravity theories are well known since quite some time. Uh, you can construct very realistic models, not only for inflation, but also for dark energy, where the same scalar field uh, is responsible both for inflation and for dark energy, which is actually the case also for the type of models of pre-geometry that I told you. Next slide, uh, Einstein frame. So uh, this case uh, look perhaps a little bit surprising, but actually when you make a translation to the Einstein frame, uh, then uh, you find that the scalar field is just um, exponentially decreasing potential, a typical quintessence potential and uh, a kinetic term and all the details are now in the kinetic term. I will not go to details. I will uh, just, uh, in the last two, three minutes, go back to quantum scale symmetry because the scaling solutions, they entail also a running from ultraviolet fixed point to an infrared fixed point and the values chi going to zero, they correspond precisely to the ultraviolet fixed point, chi to infinity to the infrared fixed point there's actually one more fixed point, which is the standard model fixed point, which is related to the fact that the electroweak phase transition is second order. And uh, next slide. These fixed points really dictate the behavior. The ultraviolet fixed point, that is the behavior and the, uh, the evolution away from it, that's inflation. And since at the fixed point we have exact scale symmetry. Near the fixed point, we have approximate scale symmetry, and that explains precisely the approximate scale symmetry of uh, the primordial fluctuations. Next slide. Um, uh, next slide, dynamical dark energy. This will be my last topic. Dynamical dark energy is actually very simply obtained in uh, this feature. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, next slide, uh, the title is Asymptotically Vanishing Cosmological Constant. If you look at the bottom of this slide, you see the form of the, gravi of the gravitational action. And it it's very simple. It is for large values of chi, it's chi squared times the curvature scalar plus a constant. And the constant is actually an arbitrary scale that you may set to 10 to the power minus three electron volt, but you see there is no other scale. So there is no tuning for a small scale. So the other scale is a pure dynamical scale. The other scale is the value of chi and chi increases, 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 and that gives you an increasing Planck scale. The only thing that you can measure, of course, are dimensionless ratios and the dimensionless ratio, that's the potential. So K to the four divided by the dynamical Planck scale. So divided by chi to the four and that goes to zero. So these cosmologies really give you a zero cosmological constant in the infinite limit. And that was actually uh, more than 30 years ago the reason for the prediction of dynamical dark energy, yeah, because in this uh, cosmologies, uh, the scalar field is not yet at the asymptotic value. It is decreases, 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 and that solves the cosmological constant problem. Actually, you know, zero minutes, so please. Okay, uh, so I go to the conclusions. Uh, 
I thought already that certain points I will not cover. So we can go to the conclusions. Uh, geometry is not fundamental. Uh, general relativity can emerge dynamically from a more fundamental theory that you can base on uh, simple Young-Mills theory. It gives rise to interesting and realistic cosmology. And in principle, once you solve the quantum field theory, you can compute this quantum, this flowing functions by scaling solutions of the functional renormalization group. And that makes the theory pretty predictive. I'm a bit sorry about uh, uh, the fact that I could not share the slides. I'm not so sure if it was easy for you and for Alessia to try to do uh, with it, but okay. And I could not see it either. And I could not see at what slide Alessia were. So it was a bit uh, guesswork. I hope uh, at least the main message was nevertheless understandable. Thank you. And when we assumed that uh, everything went well uh, most of the time, so we could uh, see the slides. Sometimes we had to uh, move one from the back, but uh, it, went, it worked very well. Uh, are there any questions in the audience here? George? Uh, hi, Christoph. Uh, George here. Uh, I appreciate. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate the comments you made or the, well, your examination of the cosmology, also the connection to the uh, asymptotic safety and the uh, relation, of course, to uh, equitations and things like that. But I was a bit surprised uh, in the first part of your talk uh, because, uh, you know, to, 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 to present gravity as a gauge theory is quite an old idea. And uh, I didn't see reference to Yutiyama, to Kindle, uh, and so on. I mean, uh, we had to go through recently uh, aiming to some fuzzy gravity. So, for instance, uh, recently we discussed how to break the conformal group in a spontaneous uh, way the way you, des uh, you described here. So, um, you did that on purpose, I suppose, or what? <laughs> uh, there is a huge literature which uh, was submitted, and uh, this was a little bit of a surprise for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was a bit short on that. Uh, uh, of course, there is uh, the fact that you can have uh, SO13 uh, is a gauge theory uh, that is Carton, essentially. Uh, uh, still, Carton is uh, relatively different because in this case, there are no new degrees of freedom. So I think the, the theories that I have found closest to my approach are actually these Poincaré uh, gravity theories for which I have given, I hope the first reference is correctly, these two Japanese that I cannot really remember. Uh, there is yeah. a lot of work uh, on it. I'm aware of it. Uh, okay. Still, I think uh, the formulation as just a standard Euclidean SO4 Young-Mills theory with this um, uh, simple uh, covariant field strength of the Fierbein squared, uh, I did not really find that in earlier literature. Well, I thought it was, but anyway, we can discuss that. I, I think Kibler did the Poincaré first and things like that. And uh, it was known also the, uh, yeah, the conformal uh, uh, with constraints, not with Higgs. And we did something similar. But having something else in mind. Anyway, we can discuss that, sir. Sure. Okay, I would like to give a word to Kelly, uh, who is online and he has raised his hand. Kelly, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, Christoph. Hi, uh, Kelly is down here. Um, it, it is not clear to me how um, you get rid of both once you uh, make the, the rotation to SO13, because then uh, for your, your new field, the 
the, the Vierbein, which is not a gauge field, you've introduced a, a minus sign in it's in the residue of the propagator. So I don't see how you get rid of the ghost associated to that. Oh, sure, the analytic continuation is, uh, is not trivial. Huh? So let's first go to, uh, the, uh, to the classical action. There it's relatively simple. I mean, there are the, uh, um, the minus signs are just the standard things that you get also from if you uh, continue a normal uh, young mills theory from uh, Euclidean to Minkowski. Of course, there are negative terms, but uh, these do not do any harm. Uh, so we know very well how to how to deal with them. Uh, so you have a minus sign so now the on the M and N indices, not just on the world indices, but on the on your sure sure sure. Uh, sure sure sure. I'm aware of that. Uh, so because they are also analytically continued, but still the propagators, uh, you know, you can just analytically continue them, and if they are fine in the Euclidean, they will and, and can be analytically continued. Uh, well, it's the same uh, in Minkowski. So there, it's very simple. Now, for the effective theory, you have to work more. Uh, you have to work more. You have, first of all, to be sure that there are no tachyons, because tachyons give you directly instabilities of Minkowski space, and that depends on the parameter range you are looking at. Uh, there are parameter ranges without uh, tachyons, and you, uh, for example, for the realistic cosmology, of course, I selected those, because otherwise you do not go to flat space asymptotically, but somewhere else. Now, the ghost issue is actually more complicated, uh, because there are parameter regions without ghosts. You really have to do the analysis. Uh, so there are parameter regions without ghosts and uh, parameter regions with ghosts. And I was pretty surprised when I tested that for the cosmological solution that this doesn't, didn't actually make much difference. It's not so clear that a ghost instability, uh, that a ghost is always a problem for stability. It's not in linear order. It has to be in higher order. Uh, but uh, there may be other constraints, as we know, for example, uh, are constraints in standard gravity. As a scalar mode, you could naively say it's a ghost, but it's constrained. It's just a Newton potential. And there may be other conserved quantities. So I am had a long time the attitude that ghosts should be avoided. In any case, I'm less sure. But there are parameters. I mean, that's the people in Poincaré uh, gravity actually found out since a long time. Uh, there are parameter regions uh, that are ghost free for the flat space. The models that I know that work, uh, for example, we earlier built a model on uh, <clears throat> an SO32 five, five dimension or Poincare, which you can reduce to point. The Poincare papers, I think, are after ours. Um, that works because you have, <clears throat> you have a spontaneous breaking of the uh, SO. SO32 down to SO31, in fact, reproduces exactly uh, general relativity. But that's that's because of a of a Higgs effect. In this case, you had you had a non dynamic a non gauge extra field. If you just look at the expansion around flat space uh -huh. of that field, set the gauge field to zero. It's manifest that you have a ghost. Well, uh, as I told the M you, index has a has a negative eigenvalue in it. The metric for the M index has a negative eigenvalue. Becomes eta mu nu rather than eta m n rather than delta. Yeah, but they mix they mix with other fields, and I mean. Uh, at least the people from this point, I didn't study all this uh, Poincaré literature. It, it was just, uh, just relatively new to me that there are such a lot of uh, analogies. But uh, they claim that there are uh, parameter regions without ghosts. So um, you have, because you have a lot of different invariants, a lot of different contractions that you can do. And... Uh, here, for example, you would say that you get immediately a ghost uh, if you have just only the F squared term, the F mu nu mn, F mu nu mn, you have negative indices, you would say that's immediately giving ghosts and actually gives you even tachyons. Uh. Yeah, it's but then you have one, other it's the other one, it's your, U, it's your U squared term that bothers me. Uh, gauge field we can discuss over, if, if I were there, I could have a glass of retina, but uh, um, the ga it's the other field that bothers me. Well, the U field does not have many, uh, uh, you know, the U field has essentially the, um, 
the symmetric part of the fluctuations, that's the graviton. And for the graviton, I discussed it very explicitly that uh, there, is, there is a parameter region without ghosts. It mixes with the gauge fields, and then there is a parameter region without ghosts. So there remains the scalar degree of freedom. The scalar degree of freedom actually can be tachyonic even. Uh, uh, that's a little bit similar to Einstein gravity. Now there remains the antisymmetric parts. And the antisymmetric parts, uh, well, that's a bit uh, complicated. You can have again to go to the mixing. But I did not, but what I checked is that there are parameter ranges without any tachyons. Uh, and what I'm not so sure is, uh, I mean, for that, I just rely on what people claim from Poincaré symmetry that there are also parameter regions without ghosts. But as I told you, I'm not so sure if ghosts are really such a problem. Uh, I thought since many, many years, ghosts are a disaster. So I tried to check and uh, it's not so obvious. Yeah, I think that I'm sorry for interrupting, but I think we should close uh, this uh, session because we have run very late here. Uh, first, we should uh, thank, thank uh, Christophe again for the nice talk. Thank you, Christophe. And uh, here we close the, the morning session, and uh, it's now the lunch break. <laughs>